Nice. Are you working on something right now? Like, are you preparing for future comps or anything like that? Or is, is this just maintain what you're doing? I was planning to compete in September. Yeah. Um, I kind of assume the comps probably won't run, but I'm still pretending they will. Yes. Yeah. Like prepare for the just in case, like competition, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Worst case scenario, I get in decent shape and just maintain for the summer. So not so, whether the comps actually run, I'm not really too fussed. Right, because it's just about, it sounds pretty intrinsic for you, is it? Or is it's, it pretty um, extrinsic too? You want to chase I those love, accolades. I love being, living like a bodybuilder, but I don't have to compete, if that makes sense. That makes sense. It's something, so it sounds like it's something about the lifestyle. Yeah. Yep. And, and the just, habits, what is that? Yeah, I love routine. Um, I'm very good at just repeating the same thing over and over and over. Um, and I just, not so much right now, but back in the day, I just loved doing everything I could possibly do to be the best bodybuilder I could be. So it's chasing, chasing that excellence in some ways? Chasing, I liked knowing I was doing things better than the next person, if right. that makes sense. Not necessarily, I didn't have to look better than the next person but I wanted to know that I was working harder than they were. Right. And that's, I think it's, I think it's a great point because you can always control that, right? Yep. I can't yep. control what you look like. Right. But I can control how, what good I am with my diet, how hard I'm training, how much I'm sleeping. I can control all my variables. Um, obviously I can't control yours. Yeah. And I think that's so many people get caught up, right? They get caught up on focusing on the things they can't control. Yep. And I think we're seeing that now a lot. Um, there's so much that are out of our control here. There's yeah. things that we can't control, right? But our reaction and responsiveness is, is, is the key thing, I think. Yep. I'm just going to get this live prepared as Justin rolls through. Now, the little home gym you got right now, is that something you cut, you train people out of? Or is this something um, you built now? It you never was. But since the gym closed... Um the day the gym closed that night, I already, I trained someone in, in the garage. So I didn't think many people would want to train, but when you've actually got a somewhat decent facility, everyone that doesn't have a gym is keen to come. So found the same been, um, it's been all right. That's awesome. Yeah. I found it similar. I think you just give people that opportunity to do something and stay healthy. Justin, can you hear us? I was connecting. How you doing? Very good. Got me. Great. So I was just trying to log onto your iPad and I couldn't link it all together for some reason, but I got you on now. So we're good. That is all good, my man. I uh, appreciate you guys doing this. We're just going to go live in just a couple moments. Um, cool. But while I do that, I might as well check in. Justin, how have you been going through all this? Um, you still able to train? Yeah, I know uh, Aaron has. I haven't trained at all since the shutdown that Monday. <laughs> Really? Look at that. No, no, no. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. It, it, it is the longest I haven't picked up a weight literally in my life. That's Super incredible. Awesome. So I'm just looking forward to the rebound. <laughs> Fucking hell. I would, uh, I don't think I'd be with us anymore if I didn't have something to do. <laughs> it's, I don't know, the first week went by and I thought, oh, okay, we'll see what happens. Second week went by and now it's just, four weeks deep and yeah <laughs> far out <laughs> that's crazy good times <laughs> i don't know i enjoy training at the gym lifting weights and i thought yeah. about gunner mates and getting dumbbells at home and i've got the three boys i just won't happen at home yeah fair enough <laughs> oh you, you, have, you have kids you got you got a you know, whole family huh yeah 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 so home training just i end up killing someone i think <laughs> <laughs> Is that is that because you don't like to mix that family and um and kind of personal development and career? Oh, yeah, exactly. I like to take it out of the house. Jim, Jim's like my escapism, I suppose. Um, yeah. That's and then enough. yeah, it's same thing, just distractions. All of the kids jumping on me while I'm doing a bench or something, and who knows what it happened. <laughs> are they are they into it as well? How do you manage like getting family and kids and children into that? Uh, I've got a nine-year-old, he's super active. Um, he just, he's just BMX riding all the time, mountain biking, going out and about. And the other ones, they, they, 
really small. So I got an almost three year old and then a geez, five week old now. Oh so, shit. Yeah, yeah, nice and fresh. Hence why he was born, this shit went down. It's like, oh, I'll take some time off. Fair enough. <laughs> How you been, Aaron? Good? Yeah, I'm good. I've I've got a couple racks and I just got some multi-gym thing built the other day. So I've got some cables now as well. Um, Doing the essentials. So, so I'm set. Um, I can do pretty much everything. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm not too fussed about this isolation thing. But I do, I do miss the atmosphere of the gym. Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely, especially if um, when I'm alone, the being in a dungeon basement by myself, I just sort of lose lose a bit of the Track, feeling yeah. in the atmosphere. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's the same as training like in an empty gym. You know, you got a gym with no motivation or atmosphere in there. Yeah, training kind of goes back. I'd, and I'd much rather be in the gym and be able to see you squatting four plates for twenty reps, and then be like, <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, I need to, I need to work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, you're at home, you're the biggest guy in the gym, aren't you? So exactly. exactly. <laughs> It's you're only competing against yourself. Yeah, that is it. The only. How did you guys meet? Um, what's the story behind that? Backstage, I guess, or on yeah, stage. Like, on stage, probably. Yeah, on stage. 2010. We had that little yeah. rivalry going on at the end of the VIX. So yeah, that was good. <laughs> that was fun. Good year. <laughs> what was what was the outcome of that? I know you guys have had like to introduce yourselves. You guys have had. Between the two of you, you guys have a lot of experience, a lot of accolades. You've stepped on the stage heaps of times. Um, so between when that happened, what was the outcome like of competing against each other in a lot of ways? Well, I'll let Justin talk about the first comp because that was yeah. the VIX. Yeah, so we did the VIX, IMBA VIX. Um, I got one up on Aaron for that one. Then we went to the IMBA Nationals. Yep. I took that one and then a bit yep. of redemption a couple of weeks later. Aaron can take over. <laughs> uh, and then we did the A and B nationals together. And from what I hear, Justin did something stupid and tried to diet down and get super light for that show and look like came in looking came in looking flat and fat. And so I, I got to beat him that day. So you guys have had the opportunity to get one up on each other each time. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. All right. Well, guys. There are, we won't worry about the, we're going to be posting this later. Um, the, the Facebook is having some problems, so we'll, we won't be technically live. So if there's anything that, you know, you guys want to edit want to out. out. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Don't feel like, you know, um, everything's on the record. Uh, this is family friendly. Yeah. Uh, no, you got be, be yourself, be yourself. Okay. Um, the goal of this was to just try and have a, an open and honest conversation. Um, and talk about all these things that are relevant and happening now and uh, give you guys an opportunity to, to promote anything that you want to um, and just talk about your careers and just help some people um, and give people value and, and an opportunity here uh, in this time. Um, but before I, all that preamble, um, I do actually want to give this live thing one more try. So I'm going to end the meeting, okay? And then I'm going to start another one. Is that cool with you guys? Yep. Yep. All right. I'll speak to you guys in a minute. Right. Cool. How do you guys think this whole situation with the pandemic going on, with all these restrictions, is, is going to change the state of our industry, your industry? And, you know, how do people prepare? How do people prepare for what's going to come out of it? What do you guys think? Who's going first? Aaron, please. All right. Um, well, I think for a time we're going to be restricted in regards to how many people we can get in a gym at one time. So if a gym's got a heap of members, uh, they're going to have to, you're going to have to schedule when you're going to train, I think, um, so that they know roughly how many people are coming into the gym at any one time. Uh, cause we're going to have to be per square meter, however many people, um, I think they're going to have to space out machines to, to abide by the social distancing thing when the gyms first open. So I think when we first open, um, things are going to be quite different, but I would assume we'll go back to normal at some point. How, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think it could be touch and go to start with in that obviously people have to try to make the bookings to use the gym, make the bookings to see a PT or a coach. Um, and then the hours, I mean, 
with most people not at work, I suppose you've got those hours of the day that they can probably go into the gym. But when things do go back to normal and we are doing the whole social distancing and certain amount of numbers per square meter in a gym, it's just going to be hard to accommodate everyone at those peak times. So businesses will struggle, struggle just with the amount of people actually coming back, I think. It's, still going, to be, it's going to be tough. See, that's interesting because the fact that it's already so tough and, and gyms and coaches and they are very limited with what, what they can do. So you guys are anticipating, and I think it's something not many people have thought about. I haven't thought about like, what. okay, we're probably going to be limited from the start with, with the people we can have in the gym. I mean, there's probably not going to be a time where it's just black and white, where it's all right, all gyms are open, or maybe it will. All gyms will be open and everything's free for all. But I think it's probably more reasonable what you guys are saying. Um, so for all the new guys coming through the industry, all the new trainers, the new coaches, how do they, in your perspective, not just survive, but thrive in, in this, in this adversity? Um, well, it'll probably be, it'll probably be a somewhat good time to, to start a business because people like Justin who have been lazy and haven't trained for <laughs> three months by the time the gym's open again, um, they'll all be keen to get back into it and, Maybe they've seen a lot of people or friends training at home and seeing people actually make some positive changes during this time. Um, maybe there'll be a bit of an influx um, when we do reopen again. Okay. Yeah, I think people will be keen to get back in the gym, especially the those that have already kind of established those um, connections with the gym that are already training. Um, they'll want to get back. Um, as regards to like new clientele and fresh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, it's just the restrictions. Um, can we go back full ball straight into the gym? I think it's going to be it's going to be hard um, to let everyone back in just the way the approach has been so far. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so this sounds like there's you guys are trying to you know there's opportunity in this adversity. There's opportunity that you know a lot of people are going to be prioritizing their health a bit more, and that's an opportunity for these new young coaches to come out and um, coach people for free or, or just help people wherever they can. Um, but in this time, a lot of flaws and weaknesses have been highlighted personally, as a coaches, as professionals, um, and as individuals, as business owners. H how do you guys think that to just kind of humanize the situation a little bit, how have you guys been seen some weaknesses or flaws that have been highlighted in your character or your business or, or you as a coach that you didn't realize before. Am, am I going first every time now? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah I like it. <laughs> you guys can like, honestly, if you guys have like Justin, if you have something you're burning to say, like, please yeah, 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 jump in anytime. Yep. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I've always worked out of someone else's gym. So as soon as, that gym closes, um, I don't have a business anymore. So that was definitely a flaw in, I guess, my business model. Um, but then I've realized I'm, I'm not, my, my business doesn't have to be specific to that gym. I can, I can run my business out of any gym, um, which I guess this has opened my eyes up to that as well. Um, you know, I, I don't need to work out of the gym I've been at for the last 15 years. Um, if I've got a squat rack and a bench in my, in my garage gym, I can, I can train someone there. Yeah. I mean, in relation to me, I'm only really doing a few online clients at the moment. I've had another business that I've been running for the last couple of years and that has basically been completely shut down um, since this happened. So I can relate that to my training as such. I mean, I trained in a gym um, without the gym. I'm not training. So that's my biggest flaw. Um, I just haven't been able to adapt to be able to train at home and, and do those sorts of things. But for upcoming new trainers or current trainers, I mean, depending on the state you're living in, you do have those whole outdoor sort of one-on-one -on -one training oh that you can semi sort of do. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Um, Justin, continue, please, what you're saying. Um, yes, I mean, you've got those outdoor sort of training options that you can do before or before gyms reopen. And then when the gyms do get back, like we were kind of suggesting before, hopefully there is that huge influx of people coming back. Um, 
And then the newbies, uh, the fresh people, we just wanted to get off their ass because they have been immobile and less active for the last however long this goes on for. Do you have, what about you? Like in a situation that you're in with, you know, you, you kind of taking an impromptu long uh, deload, if you will, or yep. something like that. Um, like how long would it have to be before, you know, you start just making do with what you have uh, and just start tr- going, training yourself right now? Oh, geez, I really don't know. I mean, in regards to weight training, I'm pretty active, so I'm still surfing. I'm still going out. I'm, oh, that's awesome. I'm yeah. doing some laboring and, and things like that just okay. to get by. Um, cool. So I'm pretty active there. So fitness-wise, general fitness, I'm not too bad. Obviously, muscular strength, endurance, and, and bodybuilding uh, is taking a big back burner, and I'm just looking at the rebound. I'm hoping there's a rebound. <laughs> we will see. You'll you. get some newbie gains. I will. I know. I'll, 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 I'll get some newbie reverse. Sort of, I'll start as a newbie for sure. All, all sixty kilos of me. Oh shit! Well, what do you, what, what do you guys uh, weighing in right now? What's your body count right now, approximately? Oh, I'm, um, about I'm, I'm about ninety three kilos, probably about fifteen percent body fat. So I'm, I'm ten kilos over stage weight at the moment. Okay. And I'm about eighty four kilos, about the same. 15% body fat um, and I'm probably three to three kilos on the stage weight. <laughs> is this, so, is yeah. this walking weight for you guys? Like you guys operate at this weight, generally speaking, just maintenance. Uh, I'm a lot lighter. I've lost about, I don't know, eight kilos. Damn. I would, um, my weight's just completely dependent on how much I'm eating. So if I've been eating a shitload of food for the last 18 months, then I'll be very heavy. Right. Um, if I've been dieting for a comp, then I'll be light. So I really couldn't give you a figure on what my body sits at because it doesn't, it doesn't sit. It changes depending yeah. on what I'm eating. It's constantly dynamic. And I think that's a really important point um, and how uh, in flux uh, physiology um, is. Um, if, I I, to- if I didn't train like Justin, I'd probably weigh about 65 kilos. <laughs> It, yeah, it drop off muscle wastage. That's what happens. Um, but he seems to be giving some credit. He's, he seems to be doing some things, just not <laughs> not weight training. But just I guess training. <laughs> we'll see when you come out of it. Um, you know, speaking a bit on nutrition, um, I know especially you, Aaron, you have pretty strong thoughts on the calories in, calories out model. Um, and I'd like to get both of your takes on this and have just like a an interesting conversation on this. Like nutrition is like. Nowadays, it gets treated as like a religion. It's, it's like, it's very hotly debated and it's blacks and whites, but there's a lot of gray. And so I, I, I would like, love you guys to, to speak on that. Um, the, the dogma of nutrition and also the more granular details of calories in, calories out. Um, what are the complexities around that? And what are the, the simplicity around that? You know, Aaron, you, um, please go first because I know you have some strong thoughts. We've seen some of your posts on it. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I always preach calories in versus calories out in regards to weight loss or weight gain. Uh, but I would also preach that you shouldn't just eat anything. Um, your, your foods should be as unprocessed as possible. You should be basing all your meals around meat and vegetables. Um, obviously you need carbohydrates from complex carb sources. You need plenty of healthy fats, um, especially as a natural athlete. Um, so at the most basic level, it's calories in versus calories out, but I would never be okay with someone just eating, you know, pop tarts for carbs and whey protein six times a day for protein and, and that kind of thing. Um, I'd always want someone eating just meat, vegetables, healthy foods and, and, and using the calories in versus calories out model, but eating healthy foods at the same time. Why is that quality important to you? Like, it's, there's obvious reasons why. Like, you could yep. talk about endocrine, hormonal. You could talk about uh, micronutrient, mineral deficiencies. What do you see as the yep. biggest benefits of, that you see from having that non-processed foods? Yep. I, I generally see people are able to eat more food. Um, so for the, for the same, I guess, for the same rate of weight loss, if you get someone just eating meats, vegetables, nuts, seeds, all that stuff, um, 
I think you can end up eating more calories and losing weight at the same rate than if you were just eating whey protein and, and cereal, for example. Do you have explanations um, on the mechanisms behind that or all your, your theories behind that? Not really. <laughs> but you know it works. I, I think it works, yes. That's my opinion. Right. Yeah, I agree with Aaron. Well, I mean, we, we sit in a very similar wavelength regards to nutrition and training and, and that sort of thing. Um, calories in, calories out your macronutrient targets and then whole food clean foods um can get more volume in so you are more satisfied less likely to eat over your quota with bad foods um easy to count yep. um and just more digestion so that whole thermogenic sort of effect of actual food i think does help a little bit um so yeah i think that works yep okay so it's but it's a really important model because you guys aren't just preaching unlimited calories of any food you're taking consideration the quality, which I think is really missed with a lot of people, especially young guys coming through. They just think they can eat anything and everything. And I mean, maybe you can, but how, how sustainable is that for uh, health? Um, and I think that's a really important consideration. And another point I wanted to bring up was reverse dieting. Um, I want you guys to speak on what that is for the for people who don't know and the principles of it and how it works and when do you know to implement reverse dieting with somebody, somebody who's been really low calories, when, when's the right time to implement reverse dieting, which is counterintuitive to what a lot of people think. Justin can go first this time. Yeah, um, so basically if someone is getting ready for a competition and they've dieted down, um, they have brought the calories down fairly low. So the metabolism has slowed down um, somewhat. They've lost a bit of weight, they've lost a little bit of muscle tissue, hopefully not too much. Um, so with that slower metabolism, by just throwing in those big cheat meals straight after getting ready for a comp, their calories are way over where they need to be. Um, so the idea is just slowly trying to bring the body's effect of burning calories back to a norm, um, trying to bring that back in, um, as opposed to just swamping the body with excess calories and it just doesn't know what to do with it. So what does it do? You put them on as body fat, get tired and lethargic, um, all the inflammation responses don't sort of help as well. So the joints can start to swell and it's just, it kind of leads for a downfall as opposed to a slow reverse out of a, a dieting phase. Um, there's less shock to the system. So your body can just adapt quicker. How slow do you do that? How conservative are you guys? You know, say someone's been in a heavy deficit, maybe it's a thousand to 1500 calories. How aggressively or conservatively are you titrating back up? I'd do a similar as a, as a dieting in. So basically you're slowly taking calories out based on your, you know, your results. So if you reduce calories and you're losing weight, you keep the calories the same until that stagnates and slows down and then you drop a few calories or you obviously do more expenditure, do more um, cardio or heavier training. Same thing. Um, basically I'd increase the calories as such that you put a little bit of weight on. And then when that sort of plateau, just slowly increase it back. So I'm looking probably anywhere from 200 to 300 calories extra. Um, as a starting point. Okay. I'd do, it, I'd, I'd do it very similar, um, except maybe the first increase, especially after a comp, um, is probably slightly bigger, a little bit of a jump first up, um, but then very slow and progressive after that. And that's completely dependent on how the, the, the client's body reacts to the, to the increase in calories. And what are the typical ways that you see people respond? I mean, I'm sure you're going to see a wide variety. Um, what do you typically see? Um, well, after a comp is a very extreme diet, obviously. Um, so everyone gains weight after a comp, um, unless they just were nowhere near lean to begin with. But if someone's actually got lean, then when you start adding calories back in, they'll, they'll put on some weight. Um, they'll feel better. They'll train better. Everything just sort of starts to normalize a little bit. But what, I find if yeah, people have gone through a very restrictive diet, say themselves, but they haven't really got very lean. Um, and when someone says they're on 1200 calories and they're not lean, mm. generally they're not on 1200 calories. They're, they, they might think, their diet should be 1200 calories, but they might eat that for two days and then they'll eat 5,000 calories and then they'll eat 1200 calories for three days and then they'll eat 5,000 calories again. So they'll tell you that they've been dieting down on 1200 calories and they haven't got lean, but 
but if you average their intake out over the course of the week, they're not actually on 1,200 calories. So when you go through a reverse and actually increase their daily intake, they might be on 1,800 calories now and they're getting leaner. Um, and they think, how is this possible? I've increased my calories by 600 a day and I couldn't lose on 1,200 and somehow my body's getting leaner. Well, we're not eating more calories. We're actually eating less because you've taken out that stupid binge that you do every now and again. Right. Um, so that's the only that's the only time I see people get leaner through a reverse is when they hadn't really been doing the right thing previously anyway, and they were nowhere near stage lean to begin with. That's a really great point you made because people kind of trick themselves into thinking they're hitting a certain intake and they're adherent, but they're not really adherent. If you look at the weekly total caloric intake, yep. um, it's still in a surplus. Yep. And I think that's such a great point you made um, that I think, so what do you put that down to? Do you guys put that down to just, they're not measuring it. They're not measuring correctly. Like, cause that's a obvious. Yeah. Mistake. Measuring uh, accountability, um, junk feed, you know, refeeds when you're just not tracking what your, your rebound is. Um, okay. Obviously that, that, that can all throw things out and it is a weekly sort of total intake. If you look at the grand scheme of things, your body doesn't really know day to day. It looks at the long sort of process, which if you can look at a week to week basis, um, it's a better idea to, to see where you're at, how to measure and track. Okay. So you just think measure. And, and in regards to the non-compliance, for me, it's just a psychological thing if people are trying to diet too restrictively and they've dropped their calories too low, um, it's, it's very hard to, to stick to an extremely low calorie diet for an extended period of time. So they'll try, but then they'll binge every now and again. And on paper, they think I'm doing things right most of the time. It's just that, that non-compliance every now and again, just skews the calories in a lot more than they probably think. Right. Great points. Like adherence, compliance, that, that is number one. That's like the top of the pyramid. If that's not getting done, then then we can't do anything else, essentially. Um, now, I want to talk about the opposite end, uh, gaining muscle mass. You know, so many guys who are, you know, you guys, we all used to be, you guys especially, you guys are big, jacked, and strong as fuck now, but you guys used to be the opposite. You used to be skinny, weak, and scrawny. So for those younger athletes, younger kids – who want to put on appreciable sizes of muscle mass, 10 to 15 kilos, how practical is it for the majority of people to gain a lot of muscle mass and stay lean while doing it? I'm talking 15% under. Or how much do we just have to accept that? You know what? Fat gain is going to come in a surplus. It's basic uh, thermogenesis. Like, what can we do? Aaron? Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, if, if you've got someone that's skinny but they're also very lean to begin with let's say they're sitting at you know eight ten percent just naturally um well then that's fantastic because we can go through a weight gain phase where they are slowly i mean for everyone that wants to gain muscle i would say they have to gain fat in the process some fat you don't have to get fat and out of shape but over the period of time that you're trying to gain muscle and get bigger and stronger in my opinion, you, you, you have to gain some body fat. Um, but if you start someone at 8%, well, then you've got a lot of room to move to get to 15. So if you're just bulking slowly for the next 12 months um, and you've gone from 8% to 12%, that person's still lean, um, but they have slowly been gaining fat a little, a little, along that time um, whilst they're gaining muscle. So I would say that you do have to you do have to gain some body fat if you're going through a growth phase, in my opinion, unless you're an absolute freak. But I'm not okay. a Yeah, definitely. I mean, you've got the whole newbie gains, which they will put on weight a lot quicker um, based on no matter what they do. You know, first time is in the gym, start lifting weights. Obviously, body types and things can take into consideration there, but they'll, they'll get some results. But then when that sort of plateaus, is, you need to look at... Um, obviously being in the calorie surplus and just progressive overload week to week on the weight training um, and consistency and then time, it's not going to happen overnight. So you just have to be consistent, plug in and push um, in regards to fat gain. Yeah. It, it, it works as a percentage. If you put on a kilo of muscle, you can expect to put on, you know, 
say 100 grams of fat, but the percentage of your body fat will still stay the same. You don't have to push out of the envelope and get up into the 20% body fat ranges, you know, 15% and under, ideally 12% for guys, I think is where they should be. Most of the time, 12 to 15 is still a good um, sort of weight gain uh, fat percentage, so long as you're still eating that calorie surplus. Okay. So it sounds like, you know, you got to make peace with the fact that, you know, a fat, like a fat gain is going to come with consuming more energy. Makes sense. But what can people do to mitigate that and to ma- maximize staying lean? And is the traditional high carb, low fat part of that answer? Um, even though, though, Aaron, I saw your, your article was simply shredded. You were on about 30%. Are calculated from that 55,000 plus calories, you were about 30% fat, to about 200 grams. Um, although that was a different stage, that is bulking for you, but it's still kind of a different stage compared to like a, a novice or a um, someone much, much less uh, muscle mass. But how much of that answer is the high carb, low fat? How effective is that in, in all of both of your experience? Um, uh, you go, Jessica. Um, carbs is fuel, so I'm, I'm big on the carbs. Um, you need, you need that to help perform in the gym. And obviously if you're performing harder, lifting heavier, lifting stronger, you're going to get the results there. So you definitely, I'm, I'm pro, pro for the carbs and I'm looking at the fats as an energy source because of the, the micronutrients that come with it, obviously. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I'd base it. Carbs is fuel, protein and, and the fats are the recovery sort of uh, macros. Okay. Um, so yeah, when the, the Simply Shredded article, I can't remember the diet specifically, but yeah, I think I was on about 400 grams of carbs, 200 grams of fat, and about 400 grams of protein or something like that? Yeah, it was 500 carb, but everything else was correct. Okay. Um, I'd never had that much fat before um, in my diet, um, but then I don't think I'd ever got my calories total up that high before either. Um, so I was just slowly gaining weight at about one kilogram a month um, on, that, on that intake. Um, and I was... I tend to bracket a lot of my carbs around training. So those meals are massive. Um, so I think I got to a certain point where I couldn't really, I couldn't physically eat any more carbs before and after training. So I was just adding a few more calories from fats. So it wasn't anything too scientific as to why I got my fats so high and I, okay. I wasn't increasing carbs anymore. Um, it was more just, I couldn't physically fit any more food in my pre and post-workout meals. So I started adding some more fats to my other meals of the day. So it's a practicality thing for you. Yep. Um, do you guys I'm, have... I'm definitely, I'm definitely a fan of high carbs as well. Um, oh. I, I can't grow on low carbs. So. Right. I mean, carbs are anabolic as well, but um, some deleterious things can happen when we have high carb and high fat, um, especially because the more glucose we consume, the more glucose gets oxidized. But the more fat we consume, the more fat gets stored away. So how yeah. do you guys think about then the macronutrient profiling for fat intake in the presence of high carb. You go, Justin. Um, I just look at as a daily total. Again, I don't really mind. If, if it's a, an off-season sort of a gaining phase, um, I, actually, it doesn't matter whether you're cutting or putting weight on. It, the carbs always uh, situate around the workouts for the performance for myself, uh, and what, that's what I do for my clients, so pre and post, definitely. And then the fats are in there just for the calories and, and the, you know, the essential fats that you need for your body. Um, and I'll place them throughout the day evenly in, in most of the meals. Okay. I, I set up my diets pretty much in exactly the same way. So, yeah, I you don't guys, know what to add to that. You guys um, don't have specific percentages? That I've you definitely like to never worked off ratios or percentages. I just look at daily totals. Um, for me, the, the ratio of protein to fat or <clears throat> carbs to fats irrelevant for me because you just guys want to hit a a caloric intake to bring about a certain physiological response yeah right okay got it um now if you guys could go back in time to the the younger scrawnier um aaron's and justin was was justin ever skinny i don't believe (laughs) i'm sure we could go back in time maybe he was like 10 yeah 10 years old he was skinny (laughs) <laughs> I've always been short. <laughs> As the, Aaron, do you say that because like you, you feel like Justin, it's always been easier for you to put on mass and you've always been like a, a bigger guy. I, I, um, won't say, I won't say easier, but 
he's just very muscular. Because I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> um, me back in the day, what would I tell myself? Um, yeah. yeah, like as a young personal trainer coming into all this. Oh, young personal trainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For success in training clients for the business or... Whatever comes to mind, whatever you think is, is valuable. And, um, uh, just, just more time on the gym floor. The more time you spend on the gym floor and experience, the more you're out there, the more people see you. Um, that's how I recommend all newbies, uh, new personal trainers coming into the, the industry. You just need to be seen. Um, you need to make sure you train. Um, too many people come into the industry and they're not really heavy into training. Um, they don't really know the gym. Um, they just do the course and think that they're ready to jump into it. But you need to live that lifestyle. Um, and anyone that is already living the lifestyle that are already training, that are already in the gyms, have a huge advantage um, when they do become a PT or step into that pathway. Yep. You need coaching reps. You actually need to do the thing to be great at the thing. Simple as that. Yep. Definitely. Time under the belt. Agreed. Aaron? I hear, I hear people preach. Yeah. Repetition. You know, if you want to get good at something, you have to, you have to do it over and over and over. And whether that's a squat or whether it's training um, a middle-aged lady in the gym, um, you just need, yeah, time under your belt, doing those things, um, learning every, every client that you learn something new, everyone's body moves slightly differently. Um, so for those, for the new PT starting out, like Justin said, you need to be in the gym and you need to be spending time in the gym. You need to be a familiar face. Um, you, you can't go in to the gym twice a week, train one or two people and then go home for the rest of it and expect your business to grow. Um, you need to be the familiar face in the gym. Um, yeah, 100%. If, if, if you've got no clients when you start out, which generally that's how we all start, we've got nothing, um, you know, you need to offer people complimentary sessions. Um, get a couple mates in every now and again and, and, and train them like you would a client so people see you in the gym training people. Um, no one's going to ask the PT at the gym that never trains anyone to train them. Uh, you need to be in there training people to, to promote yourself, um, to build your business. You can't build a PT business in the gym whilst you're sitting at home playing PlayStation. That's it. That's it, man. That's very well said. You guys like, and I think coaching people for free is something like the most practical thing that a young trainer can do immediately, right? Especially, well, you can do it online as well, I guess, but yeah. especially in the gym because the, the work you do in the gym with your clients is, is what's promoting yourself to every other member that walks in the door. I mean, be, be that PT or be that new, new personal trainer that puts their hand up to do all the gym programs for the new customers and new clients coming through, you know, depending on the gym and the health club and how they offer memberships. Um, yeah, be that first point of call. Um, do the programs, put your hand up, offer those free PTs and then just be training, be on the gym floor, be, sociali be socialising with people, obviously not too much. Um, but also look, look and know what you're doing. Um, look the part. I mean, you don't want to be look the part sounds really bad as well, but you know, you need to look like you know what you're doing. So you have, you to, have train. to, you have to, you have to be in the gym. You, that, that's what people come up to you for, you know, I they come up to advice. They come up for advice and help. Yeah. Um, they're not going to ask someone that they think doesn't know what they're doing. So this is a great point um, that yeah. I've come to think really strongly of. Um, when I got in this industry, I was, I was athletic, um, but I was, I was skinny, right? I was lean, but I was skinny, right? I wasn't, I didn't embody a strong physical presence or a like to you guys, Jack strong, big, lean that you guys have developed. Is that why you grew a big masculine beard? It's all just to compensate. It's all just to compensate. <laughs> no, uh, that, yeah, that in some ways is like, uh, you know, it's a part of it. It's like represents certain parts of self-development, the way you change your appearance. Um, but I think that's such an important component is that we don't accept, right, an overweight doctor or an overweight trainer, right? We, we will talk, we will say certain things about that, right? But on the other hand, really skinny isn't looked at the same way. And while really skinny doesn't have serious health implications, relatively speaking, compared to overweight, for a field where you have to, where you're talking about optimizing health and fitness and the human body, looking the part seems to be, and being the part rather, seems to be an incredibly important component to 
uh, providing a quality service. If you haven't done it to yourself, then, then what are you selling really? Um, what do you guys, th- I obviously have some strong thoughts about it. I won't keep going, but what do you guys think about that? Well, a, a good example on, on the whole image thing is look at all the Insta famous models. Um, they've got great rigs and they're making a killing off of dodgy programs, but they have the market there. They're making the sales because of the way they look. They're like, this person looks this way, so they know what they're doing. I'm going to follow their program and ends up spending a cut and paste job. So right. you need to provide, obviously, the knowledge as well, the education in the background, know what you're doing, but then also look the part. And then, so both. then you've, you need both. It comes, comes Absolutely. hand in hand. 100%. Aaron? Um, walking the walk counts for a lot. So living the life, you know, eating well, getting enough recovery, training hard. Um, when someone does all those things correctly, generally they'll look all right. So you don't have to be a champion bodybuilder to be a PT. But if you live the lifestyle, you'll end up looking good. So when you see someone that, that looks out of shape and that's working in the fitness industry, I'm a little bit puzzled sometimes because I think if you were doing everything you needed to do, um, you should be looking all right. Um, and some people don't look all right. Again, well, think- you, don't, you don't have to be shredded and massive but you should still look fit and healthy. Absolutely. I think it's disingenuous in some ways to sell a service where you're trying to optimize people's health and you haven't, you don't living a healthy lifestyle. That yep. seems like a contradiction to me that we shouldn't accept those standards, right? 100%. Yeah, definitely. Now, speaking of standards, okay, it's a nice segue. Um, obviously, as you guys know, we do certificate threes and fours. That's what we facilitate. And we're trying to raise the standard in that, right? But if you guys go back to your cert three and four days, um, let's be honest, a lot of them are cut and paste, copy, copy, paste jobs like these fitness influencers doing their programs. So, or maybe you, you, both of yours was, was really good, but how useful was that certification um, for you guys, honestly? Or did mostly most of it was on the on the job? Like, how much of it was on the job versus you know certification? Uh, well, for me, I definitely learnt more after I started work as a PT than than beforehand. Um, I'd, I'd trained myself already, um, and I had a pretty good knowledge on nutrition and physiology and the rest. Um, but I'd never trained anyone before, um, or I'd, I'd maybe I'd trained around my friends that were the same age at school but I'd never trained someone that was 20 years older than me and had never lifted before. Um, and we didn't do that in the course either. Um, so that was all new and exciting when I started working at the gym. I had to deal with all these weird shaped bodies and people with problems. And, and that was something that I'd, I'd definitely never done before and, and we hadn't really been taught in the course. So the practical side of things of actually physically training people, um, I just had absolutely no clue when I started. Yeah, I did. I did my course geez, years and years ago, and and mine started from me already training in the gym, um, and the local gym owner saying, "Hey, how about you go do your certificate three, and we'll give you a job. You're here enough already as it is, sort of thing." Um, so I, I did the the cert three, and and just started doing gym program after gym program, um, and then I went to university, did a marine biology course, and really? ended up transferring over to um, sports science, and then went and did my cert four, and that's when I started doing the PT. And that helped me get through um, my sports science degree uh, during university. So it was a very gradual step for myself. Um, so I didn't really feel um, bombarded with, you know, how to or what to. It just, it just crept on me. I already felt fairly confident in the gym while I was doing it. I wasn't doing a whole heap of clients to start with. There was a few here and there just to get me by until I led to that sort of full-time position. Um, and by then, I, I felt pretty, pretty comfortable with what I was doing for, for the majority of it, for sure. I'm going to take a segue to this marine biology. Did you complete the whole degree nah, there? No, I, did, I, did, I, did, I got through two and a half years and then I transferred it across and got some credit points and then I did the three years of uh, sports science. How did you... So I spent tra- five and a half years of uni for a, for a three years sports degree. <laughs> well, look, you got a little bit of marine biology on top of that. How did you yeah. transition that? What, what piqued your curiosity there? I was just already in the gym too much. Um, my, my passion just, just, just completely shifted. Um, you know, I was, I was in the gym, I was training, I was starting to do the whole bodybuilding thing. Um, and yeah, I was just more interested in the, in the sports science side of things. 
Fair enough. You got to chase your curiosity and passion, right? Mm. Um, Aaron, I know you've been uh, promoting our, our certificate and supporting us in a lot in a lot of ways, which we appreciated. What what do you what do you see the need to promote a cert three three and four through us? Like, what was that um, kind of intrinsic motivation or trigger for you? Um, it just seemed like a a decent course. Um, <laughs> it seemed to emphasize the the practical training side of things where if you're, if you're learning to, to train people, then you should probably spend a bit of time training people. Um, you need to learn all the, all the theory behind everything, obviously, which every course pretty much does. Um, but I just liked how you guys pushed, I guess the practical side of things. And it was a bit more of a, uh, an in-depth course as a whole, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's so important, right? Like I think you both alluded to it. You both said it, right? You both talked about how actually being in the gym, doing the thing is the number one thing. Um, and that you can have all the theory in the world, but if you cannot apply it and you're not confident and have that skill set to coach people in the real, like you talk about that per people 20 years older than you with all different shapes and sizes, then, um, you have a limited skill set. Uh, Speaking of limited skill sets, a lot of young coaches, you know, they lack that. What do you guys think the biggest gaps in knowledge are for current trainers and coaches? Justin, I'll let you, I'll let you go this one. For the current sort of training regime? Or yeah, what do you guys see? The- Even in yourself, maybe, but particularly with, Current just, just lacking the fundamental lifts. I mean, I think a lot of the courses really dodge around the whole deadlifting, squatting, and, and benching because uh, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, it depends which course you do now. Um, but yeah, they, they've really sort of dodged that for, for gen pop. And I think that they're fundamental movements that most people should be able to do um, or should be leading to trying to be able to do. Um, and that's where you're trying to work people. Um, in dealing those sort of results. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know, everything's OHS and safety, this and safety, that, um, and it's kind of softened uh, the market, I think, um, and, and softened the, the programs as well, if that makes sense. Well, no, what do you mean by that? Can you, can you elaborate on that? Like, what do you mean by OHS and S and like soften the market? Oh, I'll just see if I can get my words together for this. Um, yeah. You, you shouldn't squat because it's bad for your knees and your back. You shouldn't deadlift if you're a certain age because it's bad for your back. Um, when really we're built, we should do that. Unless you've got an injury, substantial injury in the past. Um, there's no reason why you can't squat. You can't lift something off the floor. You can't push something over your head. You can't push something in front of you. You should be able to do that. Everyone should be able to do that. Um, and yeah, some programs or some advisors are that you shouldn't. Um, and I think that's just it's wrong, personally. And, and it assumes that the, the problem with that thinking is it assumes that there's only one squat and deadlift variation. You don't just have to pull with a straight bar. Exactly. You don't just have to actually load through your spine. You, you can hold a goblet position. You can, you can, there's so many variations you can do. Exactly. And I mean, and most of it's, you know, get someone in a machine, get them to do this, get them to do that. Um, obviously, that's better than nothing if they've never been active before. Um, but ideally you want to get them to that spot where they are lifting off the floor, pushing out in front, pushing above the head, some, some form of variation. Right. Exactly. And it's like, we should all be able to exert, exert that and challenge our bodies with a variety of resistance training using barbells, dumbbells and, and weight training, like to demonize one particular movement or variation is, is a uh, short side of thinking. Correct. Aaron, what's your two cents? Um, I guess a common thing I see coming through, people doing the course, like if, if I take them through a session or get them to do certain exercises or they're just watching me take clients through certain exercises is they say, oh, in the course, we're told to, to stop our range of motion at a certain point and not take the shoulder so far down on a shoulder press or, or not squat so low or, or not lunge up with your knee all the way to the floor. Um, so I feel in the courses, they teach you the absolute safest way to do every exercise so that no one's going to stress themselves too much and get injured. Um, which is fine if that was their number one goal to just never hurt themselves 
Um, but if you've got someone that's coming into the gym that wants to perform to the absolute best of their ability and grow as much muscle as possible or get as strong as possible, um, then that's not the same way that you train that person. You know, you, you'd have to take this person through a greater range of motion on a shoulder press to, to, to get the best out of their, their delt workout. Um, so I feel like the courses teach people how to train too safely um, as opposed to how to train most effectively. That's a great point. Uh, and I think that anytime you're doing physical activity, weight training, look, everything has an element of risk and danger, right? We're applying stress to the body in pretty uh, traumatic ways um, in some ways, right? There is a risk involved, but you put implement things to, to manage that risk, okay? Whether it's implementing smart sleep strategies to recover properly or is to not be a fucking a, a bro lift and not have a spotter on your 200 kilo bench press. Like some common sense goes a long way. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, to finish off guys, cause I want to be respectful of, of your time. Um, are you guys being heavy in the bodybuilding realm? Um, this is a pretty like common question. A lot of people get asked, but I think it's especially relevant for the aspiring bodybuilder physique competitor that might be watching what is some practical advice that that you wish you knew you knew back then that you would give to to these guys you go justin i wish i started training legs earlier that's me back in the day (laughs) (laughs) um um, just a balanced program you know, balance program, be consistent. Um, more isn't necessarily better. So you've got all those bro shifts doing, you know, five, six day workouts. If you're a new guy in the gym, you can't recover that well. Um, so you get, get a mentor, get a coach, get a proper program that periodizes um, uh, your needs um, as you go. Um, definitely get some help. Um, don't just wing it unless you are genetically gifted. Um, you won't go as far as quick. And it's not a, it's not a race though. It's a, it's a, it's a long haul. It's a marathon. It's not going to happen. Don't expect right. to win your first show. Um, that's for sure. It's good to, but don't expect to. Did any of you guys? I, d- I definitely did. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 did, I did. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> you both did. That's hilarious. Oh, how, God. how many years had you been training for before you did your first show? Well, that's the thing. Yeah. So 16, first show was 20, so four, four and a half years. Okay, so I'd been training for 10 years before I competed. Wow. Yeah. So I'd hope that I would win as a novice right. after training for 10 years because everyone backstage was like, oh, yeah, I've been training for two. I was thinking, what? Two years? I was like, I've been training for 10. Um, to well, get you, to get, this point. you get people that have never trained before, though, that come into the gym and they want to do a competition because it's a goal. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and they're great to set goals and it's got to get them on their path, um, but don't expect to win. It's just uh, one of those things. Just do it, do it for yourself. Time, put, put, put the years under the belt, repetitive, what we've been suggesting and saying. Yeah, it's a lifelong habit, this will be. Yeah. So uh, advice for little Aaron. Um, I definitely didn't get my nutrition sorted for quite a few years. What were the mistakes uh, you were making? Uh, I just wasn't eating much, that's all. Uh, I was doing a shitload of activity um, and I wasn't, wasn't really interested in how much food I was eating. I was just eating like everyone else ate kind of thing. Um, and if I was wanting to change my body, which to be honest, when I first started picking up weights, I wasn't really interested in changing my body. I was just lifting weights for the sake of doing some exercise. But if I look back and think, wow, I could have started making a lot more changes earlier on. Well then I would have eaten a lot more protein as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the same as well. Definitely. Definitely nutrition back then. Such a common one. And it's like, continually people keep making the mistake it's almost like we all have to so many have to experience it in their own way to really learn the lesson i mean i'm the same i was the same and i only recently realized like oh wait oh, i'm not going to gain any muscle mass considerably on three thousand calories oh okay i have to really be aggressive like you just have to be it goes hand in hand i mean if you're eating great 100 percent, but you're not training 100 percent, then you know your body doesn't need that recovery fuel as much, as much, does it? And vice versa, if you're absolutely smashing yourself in the gym, you know, training as hard as you can, intensity is through the roof, but you're not providing the fuel to recover. 
you're not going to go as anywhere as efficiently either. So right. hand in hand, they work together. Absolutely. It's multifaceted. Um, and then the, you can look at sleep and recovery and everything else as well. But um, yeah. We put that quote up um, by one of you. It was great. I mean, the, um, the ordinary actions, like the ordinary actions quote, um, that training, nutrition, sleep, it's all just a bunch of ordinary actions put together. Was that you, Aaron? Um, I think I've said something like that in the past. Just, um, you know, if you look at every day in isolation and you say, oh, I slept well today or I, I, I hit my macros today or I, I progressed in the gym today, like in isolation, it means close to nothing. You know, one good day means nothing. But one good day after, the next, effort. after the next, after the next months, years on end. Yeah you'll end up with some fantastic progress. It was the success of the accumulation of many seemingly ordinary efforts that together over time can be something great. Something like that. <laughs> no, but it's, I think what you just made, like one good day is next to meaningless, right? But also people trip out over one bad day, right? They like, are they freak out? Oh, I missed my calories. Oh, I didn't train. Oh, I fucked up sleep, right? How do you guys think about the mentality of we overreact to one bad day. People definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It can, it can set the ball rolling. I, I messed up yesterday. I'm going to mess up today. And that just keeps going, keeps spiraling, but it is just one day. And it, it means nothing in the grand scheme of a, of a 12 week prep or a year long sort of gains program it, that the minuscule, the one days, it's the, how many of those one days linked together over the period that you don't want to do. Great. Like myself, how many of those one days aren't I training? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're building up week yeah. by week. Well, oh, yeah. look, may, maybe you come back after this and you have a renewed sense of, uh, um, renewed sense of, I don't know, whatever word you would call it. Um, well, that, Justin, can you take weekly updates when you start training again? I'll, I'm, I'm actually planning on doing that. When, when yeah. the gym's open and I know I can train, I'm looking at this is my... Take some weekly photos and, and put together like a six month like collage or something. This is what I look like not training for five five months and yeah. this is this is my day to day or week to week progress. That'd be awesome. <laughs> there you go. It's like uh, isolation gains. Or the, opposite. <laughs> the opposite. Yeah, it's the opposite. Um, the one one thing uh, Alex Karamuz is the other other owner of Orphic. He he let me know that Aaron apparently you used to know. Ziz, I'm, uh, sure you, yeah. I'm sure you've been asked about this before. What was your, for those who don't know, what was your relationship? How did you know him? And what was your experience knowing him? Um, we got to know each other online. So back in the MySpace days. Damn. Um, so oh, this was back, MySpace. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, so this is back before he was Ziz. Uh, so he was just Aziz. Um, and he'd messaged me and we were just talking random bodybuilding stuff, diet, training, that kind of stuff. Um, and then he and his sort of crew used to come down and go to festivals in Melbourne because they were all from Sydney. Um, and we just had some mutual friends in sort of the, the club scene. Um, so we'd caught up a couple of times in Melbourne um, and we just kind of kept in touch a little bit online. Uh, so that was, that was our relationship. It's not like we were, we were close friends and best buddies, but we just, I guess, had a mutual love for changing our physiques. Do you have a favorite moment? Was there, is there a particular, it could be even very brief, like a, a, a moment that was either funny or memorable? Yep. Um, it was at Love Machine in Melbourne, probably on a Saturday night, um, which was kind of like Wog Night, I think. Or maybe it was a, maybe it was a Friday night. I can't remember, but I was usually one of the few uh, skips in the club. Um, and <laughs> as and his brother said, were there with some friends as well. And I just remember watching them dance like the whole night. And at first I couldn't figure out whether they were trying to dance like idiots or whether that's just how, how they like to dance. Um, but they were just, they were just having fun. Um, that was them. So that's probably my most endearing memory yeah, um, just watching him, watching him muzz on the dance floor. <laughs> that's iconic. Now that's all these memes about it for years and years. You got to witness it in real life. <laughs> yeah, I did. 
that's a uh, that's a unique memory. Um, I guess what the last place I want to finish off is, you know, what's next for you guys? How do you guys make this time most as the most productive for yourselves? And, and what do you see the rest of 2020 um, looking like? You got Justin saying he's just sitting around not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it as a as a recovery phase. Um, these joints are feeling great again. The knees are, are good. My back's coming good. Um, so I'm hoping when I get back, I'll have absolutely no niggles because there were a few little tendon, tendonitis issues happening. Um, and I'm looking at it as family time, really. Um, I've got the newborn, two other boys, more time at home. Um, maybe a little bit of professional development in here, just trying to upskill myself a little bit just in some certain things. We'll see how we go. I'm just hoping it's over sooner rather than later, though. I hope we can get back to normality. This is killing me. <laughs> is, is the newborn boy or girl? Little boy. All boys now. Chase, all boys. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you care if they lift? <laughs> Do you anticipate a day where they're going to be, you know, jack, just beasts running around? Oh, uh, well, Tyler's a three-year-old. He's already running around saying he loves Hulk and smashing things. Um, Ollie's an older one, nine. He, he's just active. He's like, ADHD, not really, but he's like that. Yeah. Like he's just yeah. running. So he's active. They're all active kids. I like getting out. Um, lifting wise, oh, I prefer they played golf or tennis. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> whatever they like, I like to get them in the gym. I'm not sure about the whole bodybuilding scene. It's whatever they like to do, though. Fair enough. That's an open minded parent right there. Aaron, um, what's next for you? I'm a bit. I'm a bit the opposite to Justin. Like. Being in isolation has allowed me to focus more on my training, my sleeping, my eating, because I've just got more time to do everything. Um, so I've, I've never, well, I haven't taken, I guess, much time off work ever. Um, and I've always been trying to work more rather than less. Um, so for me to be having such a, a lull period in regards to my work, um, it's allowed me to focus a lot more on myself in regards to doing the things that I, I love doing, which is just, trying to be a bodybuilder again. So that's what I'm doing for the rest of the year. Um, just eating, sleeping and training. And I was planning on doing a comp in September, a few comps. Um, I'm still planning to do the comps in September if they run. Um, I'm, I'm 50, 50 in regards to them actually being on. Um, everyone seems to say that they'll still run, but I'm, I'm doubtful because like people like Justin who haven't been in a gym for months, they're not, going to, they're not going to compete in September. Um, so I think the comps are going to be quite thin by the time we get there. If no one's been in the gym for six months. Yeah. Great point. Um, it will be very interesting to see how we come out of this. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefits come out of this and there's a lot of weaknesses that are being exposed in our systems um, that we can all address within ourselves. Uh, is there any last comments parting words you guys have or, and where, where can people find you if they want to find out more oh thanks for having me on board um of course this, this sort, of, sort of podcast thingy appreciate, um, appreciate it just facebook facebook dm me there that's the easiest way if you have any questions or want to get in touch um yeah that's my parting word thanks <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Aaron? uh yeah facebook or instagram's easy uh if you want to contact me um, and I don't really have any other parting words. Just, um, if you want to get the most out of your physique, then you need to focus on your nutrition, your training and your sleep. The foundations, the big rocks. It's, it's not, it do the basics, do the basics better than everyone else. And you'll, you'll look pretty good. Agreed. Those are some strong parting words to finish on lads. I really, really appreciate your time. Um, you guys are welcome back anytime and thank you so much for, uh, you know, supporting us and, um, giving people an opportunity to take some value from, uh, your experiences. Thank you guys. Thank you. See you, Bye, Justin. Justin. See, you, Aaron. See you guys.